So when I was seven years old, my parents took me to Paris. Now, if any of you have been to Paris before, you'll know that it's a city which is full of rich history, beautiful architecture, and escargot. And while I like to think that I would appreciate most of those things today, when I was seven years old, my priorities lay elsewhere. The only thing that seven-year-old Pete was really thinking about during that time was what Pokeball he should use to catch Mewtwo. But there is one memory from this holiday which I think I will maybe never forget, and that was the day we visited the Louvre. If you don't know what the Louvre is, let me tell you a little bit about it. The Louvre is the largest art gallery in the world. It holds over 38,000 pieces of art on display, and has over 600,000 pieces in its entire collection. But of the 600,000 pieces of art that are in the Louvre's collection, there's only one that 99% of tourists actually remember and that is the Mona Lisa. Now, I'm almost certain that you have heard of or seen the Mona Lisa at some point in your life. But if you haven't been to see the Mona Lisa yourself in the Louvre in Paris, let me tell you the kind of experience that you'd be in for. You see, the thing with the Louvre is that it's absolutely enormous. And they strategically don't place the Mona Lisa near the entrance to the museum. Instead, the Mona Lisa is put in the heart of the museum. And in order to get there, you have to navigate these long hallways and winding staircases, all adorned with countless pieces of priceless art that are largely getting ignored by the tourists rushing past them. Thousands of tourists, including my family at the time, will dash past all of these amazing pieces of artwork just to follow the signs that say Mona Lisa this way. And let me tell you, you have to walk a long way before you get to see the Mona Lisa. And after this massively long journey that I went on with my tiny little child legs, the only way to describe the experience of seeing the Mona Lisa in the flesh was stupendously underwhelming. You see, when you get to the room with the Mona Lisa, you can hardly see the Mona Lisa at all. Firstly, the Mona Lisa is stored behind thick layers of bulletproof glass, which means that the painting is slightly obscured and very far away. Secondly, when you get to the room, there are going to be hundreds of other tourists who have just gone through the same long journey that you got to, which means that they're all kind of sweaty and stinky, and they're all crowded together like sardines, trying to get a glimpse at the Mona Lisa. What's more is that all of them will be clamoring over each other, trying to get their cameras above the heads of the crowd, in order just to get some really crappy photo of the Mona Lisa, which almost certainly will be worse than something that you could simply find off Google Images. Now, because I was only a little kid when I went to the Louvre, it meant that I couldn't see over all of the taller adults around me. And so instead of looking at the artwork, I was looking at them the people in the room. And when I think back to this experience, it made me realize that this is one of the most bizarre displays of human behavior I've ever seen in my life. What could possibly be so valuable about the Mona Lisa that all these people are willing just to cram into this sweaty, stinky room just to take a crappy photo of it, and in doing so, largely ignore the thousands of other priceless pieces of gorgeous artwork that hung on the walls of the Louvre? And beyond that, it made me ponder an even deeper question. What is it that differentiates a valuable piece of art to one that nobody knows about? What is it about art that humans value. Now in order to try and solve this mystery I want to show you another painting but I don't have to take you to Paris to show you this one I just have to take you downstairs. That's the painting I want to show you. So you and I we're gonna play a game with this painting. So the way this game works is that I want you to decide on a price that you would be willing to pay in order to obtain this painting. It can be whatever price you like but the next stage of the game is that I will be telling you pieces of information about that painting and then you decide if that information increases or decreases the amount that you're willing to pay for the painting, okay? Okay, so here's the painting. You should have decided by now what price you're willing to pay for it, uh, but now I'm gonna tell you some information. So the first piece of information is that this is not just a painting of some generic rock band, but instead this is a painting of the Rolling Stones. That right there, that's Mick Jagger. So maybe you knew that before, maybe you didn't, but decide now if me telling you that this is a painting of the Rolling Stones, does that increase or decrease the amount that you're willing to pay for the painting? Okay, the next thing I want to tell you about this painting is that it's not just a picture of the Rolling Stones, but it's a picture by one of the Rolling Stones. You see, this painting was actually painted by Ronnie Wood, that guy right there, and you can see a signature in the corner, Ronnie Wood. So, does this increase or decrease the amount that you're willing to pay for the painting? Knowing that it's not just a picture of the Rolling Stones, but actually painted by one of the Rolling Stones. Now, if any of the information I just told you about this painting made you change your valuation of it, I want you to consider this fact. The painting itself didn't change the entire time you were playing that game. The way the light bounced off that painting and affected the retinas in your eyes was exactly the same from the moment we started to the moment we ended the game. Yet somehow the extrinsic factors, the extra information, the story I told you about the painting and about the painter themselves, 
made you change your valuation of the painting. Somehow the story of the painting literally made you value a product more. So this should provide the first clue as to why we value some pieces of art like the Mona Lisa far more than others. It's rarely actually about the art itself, but instead more about the story, the signal, and the information extrinsic to the art that gives art the bulk of its value. But I want to peel this onion a layer deeper. What is it about these extrinsic factors that gives art value? What is it that humans are actually looking for? To help us understand this question a little better, I think it's a good idea for us to look into nature. I want you to meet the satin bowerbird, native to the rainforests of Eastern Australia. The satin bowerbird is a fascinating creature because it engages in a mating behavior which has a lot of parallels to humans creating art. The behavior I'm talking about is a courtship ritual done by the male bowerbirds. In the lead up and during the mating season, the male bowerbird will spend almost all day, every day, meticulously building, maintaining, and most importantly, decorating its bower, which is a special kind of nest designed for only one purpose, and that is to win the favor of female bowerbirds. Now having the best bower is a big deal to these birds. The bower bird with the best bower can mate with up to 30 females in one mating season, whereas the males with the less popular and less attractive bowers will most likely not get to mate at all. And when it comes to the female bird's point of view, we actually see that the female birds go and inspect all of the male bowers before they go and make the decision about which male they want to mate with. So how do the female birds decide which male bower is the best? Now you may have noticed something funny about these bowers already, and that is the abundance of blue objects. You see from the female bird's perspective, the most impressive thing that a male can show them is the number of blue objects in the bower. And what makes blue objects so special to the bower bird is that blue things in nature are rare. Green things and brown things are abundant in the rainforest, but blue things are very hard to come by. You'll be lucky if you find some blue snail shells, maybe some blue petals, perhaps a shiny beetle, but certainly they don't abound. Now, since the advent of human trash, bowerbirds have been seen to pick up industrial objects as part of their displays too. Things like bottle caps, plastic forks, and even disused nerf darts are all commonplace in the bowers of modern day bowerbirds. But it's the fact that these blue objects are rare and hard to find that makes them so valuable to the bowerbirds. Are you starting to see the parallels with art collecting here? The other thing that makes female birds so attracted to male bowerbirds with lots of blue things is that they know that all the other male bowerbirds are also trying to build nests with blue things in them, which leads to this pretty hilarious looking practice of bowerbirds stealing from each other. Male bowerbirds are constantly raiding each other's nests, trying to steal each other's most prized blue objects. Which means when it comes time to mating season and the females are ready to choose their male, the male with the most blue things not only has had to acquire those rare blue things, but also has had to fend off and fight the other male bowerbirds in order to keep hold of them. So let me explain why I think humans value fine art like the Mona Lisa by drawing some parallels to the behavior of bowerbirds. My argument is that we don't value art because of its intrinsic qualities. Instead, we value art because of what it symbolizes to us. In the same way that the bowerbirds don't appreciate blue objects for the fact that they're blue, but instead they most likely appreciate blue objects because blue things are hard to find. And in the same way, that can help us explain why old art from the Renaissance era is so much more valuable today than it was at the time, because the age of it adds a preservation factor, which means that in modern days, it's even rarer and harder to find good quality Renaissance art, making the art more valuable. Secondly, fine art resembles a kind of fitness display. The fact that we can hold on to extremely valuable pieces of art for any extended period of time is an impressive display to show to other humans. It shows that we were able to fight off other people who were trying to obtain the same piece of art as us, and therefore it raises our social status amongst our contemporaries. Anybody else in this room may buy or bid, but now I sell to you, madam, for 97 million. 97, thank you. Okay, so all this talk about bowerbirds can help us to understand why people value Renaissance art generally, but it still doesn't solve my Mona Lisa paradox. The paradox of why were all of those tourists in the Louvre so obsessed with the Mona Lisa and not looking at the other paintings in the building? Well, that brings me on to my last point, and to explain my last point, I need to show you one more painting. That painting is The Wedding at Cana. Now the reason why I want to show you The Wedding at Cana is because it's a painting that you've never heard of, yet I can guarantee that this painting receives exactly the same number of visitors per year as the Mona Lisa. 
So how can the wedding at Cannes receive the same number of visitors per year as the Mona Lisa, but yet you've all heard of the Mona Lisa, but I'm sure very few of you know about the wedding at Cannes. Well, that's because the wedding at Cannes is the painting that sits directly opposite the Mona Lisa. It's this enormous painting that sits in the same room as the Mona Lisa, but everyone has their back turned to it and their cameras pointed towards the Mona Lisa. So why do I think that people value the Mona Lisa so much more than the wedding at Cana? Because from a technical perspective, the wedding at Cana is almost certainly just as impressive. My argument is that the reason why everyone cares about the Mona Lisa, but not the wedding at Cana, is because the Mona Lisa is Da Vinci's masterpiece. Everyone knows Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci is the king of Renaissance artists. But while the Mona Lisa is da Vinci's masterpiece, the wedding at Cana is Veronese's masterpiece. And you don't know who Veronese is. You've never heard of Veronese before. In fact, you know so little about Veronese that you didn't even realize that the picture that I just put on the screen was not even of Veronese. That's Botticelli. So the overarching point of this video is that people don't care about the creation, they care about the creator. And this argument can sometimes make people feel very uncomfortable because we like to think that we value things because of their objective qualities, but that simply isn't the case. What I hope I've demonstrated in this video is that you can create far more value if you do it psychologically within the minds of your consumer. And I used fine art as a prime example of this because you can't change fine art. You can't give fine art Bluetooth to increase its value. Instead, you have to just take it as it is and the value has to be created psychologically. And as I've explained, all you need is a good story and a good brand, and that suddenly makes your art so much more valuable. Yeah.